conducted with uh, W. Wayne Townsend for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, October the 25th, 2007, uh, at the Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Good afternoon to you. Hi there. Tell us a little bit about where you were born, your early years, and your siblings, and um, okay. go. I was born and raised uh, 80 miles east of Lafayette, near Upland. This is in eastern Grant County, uh, last of a large family, sort of an after, afterthought. Uh, everyone was much older than I was. And uh, How many were in, how many in the family, how many siblings? Uh, six, originally, and uh, I had a sister who uh, did not live to be old, but uh, had a uh, health problem, and there then were five of us, and all came to Purdue. Okay. What, what was the school like in early years? Was the school small? Or tell us a little bit about that. Well, my oldest brother started here in 1930. As I recall, there were about 4,500 students on campus at that time. And uh, uh, my next sister graduated in 1939. There were four here during the 30s. And I uh, started in 1951. But uh, the rest of the family. Uh, everybody has a Purdue degree. Every, all my siblings, all my wife's siblings, and all of our children have sure. Purdue degrees. Had your parents got, had your uh, parents? No. Uh, How'd you happen to come to Purdue? Well, long story. Uh, my parents only went to the eighth grade. They were born in the uh, 1880s, and at that time that was the uh, right. norm for uh, to complete what was then called a common school. But we're very interested in education. Uh, almost demanded <laughs> that we do better than they did. And uh, we're very supportive. And my oldest brother had a very kindly high school principal who thought he was an exceptional student and insisted he go on to college. And uh, when he went, everybody else went. And those were tough days back during the mm -hmm. Depression and right. not much in the way of resources. And Mother and dad struggled, but they lived to see all their children graduate from college. Very. What was your high? What was the high school? Was it a large high school no. that you went to? Small town. Okay. But Small town high school. Uh, my name is Wayne, but I was never Wayne in high school. It was either Jim or George, and same thing in college, and <laughs> to a certain extent, but, uh, they had remembered my older brothers ahead of me, and. Uh, I never caught up with being Wayne uh, until I suppose almost out of college. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how those things come about. Yeah, you know? it, it is. And uh, it, the my siblings were good students, and uh, we had a common Latin teacher for all of us who was some sort of an icon. In high school. Yes, and I had I had no choice except to make A pluses in Latin. I uh, I would have been. <laughs> <laughs> punished. <laughs> I had anything else besides that. But, uh, uh, but school was important. Yeah. And uh, Where did you live when you were on, on campus here? Tell I us a little bit about what campus uh, was like. Well, like except the first semester, I moved in, then moved into a fraternity house. The first semester was at the height of the GI experience. And that itself was, a, was something. And... Uh, at that time, my uh, housing was terribly short. Here on campus? Oh, yes. You had to have an address to be a student, to be admitted, and a local address. And uh, they had kids everywhere. Uh, we had a tremendous influx of GIs uh, following World War II. And my first semester, I lived in an upstairs uh, room across town. And then I was pledged to the fraternity house at Alpha Gamma Rho and moved in, started my second semester, and lived there. For the rest of the time then? Yes. What sort of activities and clubs did you belong to when you were here? Uh, everything. Okay. Athletics included? Well, I went out for freshman football, and uh, but I did not run fast enough. I could throw the ball a country mile, but... Uh, <laughs> You have to have I, the other part to go with it, right? I, you had to run. Right. <laughs> and that was never very good. Yeah. But uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. But uh, I uh, 
probably spent too much time in activities uh, on campus and not left the library, but uh, okay. I did learn lots of things. Right. What was your major? What's your Agriculture. Major? Agriculture, okay. Yes. What was Chauncey Village? I usually ask people that, particularly in, the, in, in this era, we're trying to <clears> fill in a lot of the gaps, both at the university and in the community <laughs> around. What, was it, what, uh, uh, Chauncey Village, was that uh, not as large as it is now, or? No, the, you know, the nothing was as big as it is now. And sure. Traffic, we thought at that time, was horrible, but not as right. cumbersome as what it is now. But uh, uh, the university has suddenly grown, and, uh, had been about 7,000 pre-war. And suddenly we doubled that almost overnight. It, when you were here? Yes. Uh -huh. It fell off to probably, uh, again, the 4,500 or so during the war. And uh, suddenly the GIs came to campus and surprised everyone. Uh, it's been pretty well documented, but uh, Nelson Parkhurst was in the registrar. Mm -hmm. I recognize his name. He had been a BOAG teacher uh, outside of town and uh, was hired by R.B. Stewart uh, about that time. And Nelson almost hit it on the head so far as projected enrollment. I was concerned, missed it just a few when everybody else was way off base and prompted R.B. Stewart to tell him, uh, Nelson, uh, you're pretty good, but I want you to know profits die early. But uh, Nelson, I think, is still living at Westminster here and uh, uh, still very much alive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, then what was your career path after you uh, left, after you graduated from college? What, what uh, was the next step? What did you do? Well, I was 21 when I started. Uh, and 25 when I graduated. I was placed in a limited service classification uh, during World War II and otherwise might have gone to the Army. I could not get an advanced ROC, ROTC because of that. And then at age 28, I was drafted into the Army uh, after having been married and uh, Helen was expecting at that time. And uh, we had a very pleasant Army experience, uh, but uh, uh, again, the uh, schedule was disrupted a bit, and uh, I was 30 years old when I got out of the Army. Where did, were you served in the States, in the United States? I or? did. Okay. I uh, had, was very privileged. I uh, uh, spent my service time basically in civilian clothes as a spatial agent at counterintelligence car. And I was lucky enough to qualify for that and spent our service time in Washington, D.C. Lived in College Park, Maryland. Uh, Could you, was your wife with you? Could she yes. Be? Oh, that was nice. Following uh, training, sure. she was with me. And uh, our first child was born at uh, Ford, Mir uh, Mead, uh, Maryland, and the uh, uh, second child was born at Walter Reed Army Hospital. So we, we were lucky. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And then after you got out of the service, what? Back to the farm. Okay. Yeah. And at that time, uh, we, when I came to Purdue, uh, I thought the chances of going back to the farm were pretty great, and uh, uh, there was a course called General Agriculture that uh, for those who might think about going back to the farm, and it gave me a lot of flexibility to do those pick and choose uh, courses on campus that I really wanted to take, pick and choose professors that were exceptionally good, and I thought my experience here at Purdue was, uh, was mm -hmm. wonderful. All right. Any professors, are there still here that you uh, keep in touch with any of them? Well, I have two very much alive yet. One is Earl Butts, uh, was, okay. who taught me most of the mischief, I know. And uh, was, uh, you know, he was, his classes were fun. And uh, I learned a lot from him. Another one was my, was my brother-in-law, who is, uh, will be 90 soon. Uh, still living, still teaching me. Who, He's, and what is your brother-in-law's name? His name is Lowell Hardin. He oh. taught farm management. Yeah. Okay. Lives out in Westminster. And uh, Lowell was an Aggiecon uh, professor who later <coughs> was department head. He later on went to the Ford Foundation in New York City and was in charge of their world food research programs. Came back and still comes to the office. Very good. At 90 years of age. Very good. Now let's move on to the board of trustees. You were appointed by the governor. You were yes. one of the governors. Governor Biden. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, not, not as an alumni, just a, an appointment by the governor. Well, the to, governor Because I try to clarify for researchers so they know right. the status of... There are ten trustees. Okay. There are three alumni, mm -hmm. okay. one student, 
on sex appointed that uh, are gubernatorial appointments. Okay. And I came on the ward in 1989 as a gubernatorial appointment by then Governor Bai. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then now you were vice, you've been vice chairman. Let's talk a little bit about some of the, you were chair of the physical facilities committee. Yes. You want to tell us a little bit about the nature well, of that? Well, it's the committee that oversees the uh, construction and maintenance of uh, the physical facilities out of the university. Uh, I work with the, uh, the uh, construction management people and the uh, people who are charged with that uh, sort of responsibility. And, you know, it, it was a learning experience. I think I was chair of that probably for 12 years or so. Mm -hmm. But uh, Purdue has an excellent program in, in building, repair, and maintenance. And the physical facilities of the university yeah. are in great shape. Right. Uh, it's a challenge now because we have constructed some several new ones. And uh, it's a constant uh, upgrading of them. And, maintenance program to make sure that the laboratories and the facilities that are here to for young people to learn in are first class. All right. Now some of the things involved in was Discovery Park and the Bell Tower were some of the things that came around during that time. And you were also vice chair from mm -hmm. 93 to 2004. Mm -hmm. um, the one of the things that I read was called a fast track project. That was the visual and performing arts. Uh, that was an expression in there. We may want to clarify that for if somebody's just fast track on, on what they got it going quicker or well the, they, they address this in some newspaper I, article what, I what, what may have been in the uh, in the press uh, it's a nice building following the war when there was such a demand for World War II yes such a demand for facilities. There are a lot of temporary buildings put up on campus, oh, yeah. including the Quonset Huts at the corner of Stadium and, uh, and Northwestern. I had English in one of those Quonset Huts. <laughs> and not, they were temporary. Permanent temporary, as many people <laughs> refer to them <laughs> as. <laughs> well, I, I had not been in those probably for close to 50 years. <laughs> I was on the board. And um, we had kids going to class in those. And going through there one day, here you know, here we have a program at Purdue, who was the first class educational institution with facilities that were horrible. And I think it was a story uh, run on that after that that some of us made a comment, you know, if we're gonna have this, let's, let's, let's find a better place for it. Sure, right. And there was quite a move at that time to round up enough resources yeah. to go in another direction with yeah. facilities for those kids to it had to be discouraging to both the, the students and the faculty who were working with the facilities that were right. I gave at that time. I gave a couple of lectures over there on demonstrations, and you know that was the first time I went there. It was I'd seen them from the outside and to be in. It was, it was an interesting experience. Well, they, so. they, they, they served us well. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it was time. <laughs> right. Yeah. And one of the things, the capital improvement plan. You work on um, many of those things too. Physical facilities as a capital improvement. Mm -hmm. Is that talks about refers to the university, just mm -hmm. for clarification for the researchers. Well, the trustees are, char trustees are charged with the or saying the uh, the property of the university. And this is a pretty pretty important committee. Uh, Byron Anderson uh, right. oh, was chair uh, previous to time that uh, I took over and I learned a lot from Byron and those people who work with him. But uh, it's, a, it's a good piece of the the responsibility of the That's university right. to, to maintain the facilities. Do you have any contact? Does this include also the facilities at the regional campuses, or does does that come under the yes, just two? It does. Okay. Well, uh, some of the regional campuses. Okay. Calumet, IPFW at Fort Wayne, and uh, Westfield. Okay. Those are under the, under the jurisdiction of the uh, Purdue Board. The board at or the uh, regional campus at Indianapolis is in the jurisdiction of the IU Board. Okay. And that would include phys physical facilities as well. They would take care of that. Okay. Okay. Um, the strategic plan, which was to lay out the vision and mission statement and goals for Purdue for the next five years: mm -hmm. discovery, learning, and engagement. Mm -hmm. um, some comments on that. It really well, that was the result uh, of work that was done at the time of the search committee uh, that hired Martin Jiske, and uh, one of the missions of the board 
was to review where we are and what we want to be. And uh, we had hired a search firm to assist us in that. And one of the first things that the search firm did was to interview university leadership about what they thought Purdue should look like. And from that came the, the roots or the genesis of the strategic plan. Uh, I, th I thought it was a very useful experience. Mm -hmm. I think we've made progress in yeah. bringing people together. And one of the messages we got from that uh, exercise was to get rid of our silos, to encourage people to work together, right. to bond together for a common cause, and uh, prioritize those things that are terribly important to our mission. I thought it was a very useful exercise, and the plan itself right. was a very useful exercise. Not everybody had unanimous agreement on it, but uh, the board that I worked with, uh, I think it's a very important approach to take to problem solving. No one had an individual agenda. Uh, no one came on with some specific thing they wanted to do for themselves, but there was a commonality of what is best for Purdue. Right. And one uh, uh, discussion was finished and events took place, we all moved in one direction. Right. Very well, successfully. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Tuition, of course, is one thing that mm -hmm. comes aboard the board and it's always a challenge, isn't it? I've addressed yeah. that with some of the other Very much so. people too and it try to, it's a mm -hmm. balancing thing and it's, mm -hmm. it's difficult to uh, try to put it in play and things of that sort. Um, diversity and its relation to the strategic plan, uh, that sort of worked in together, didn't it? Uh, I think it made progress. Right. Uh, we had a presentation shortly after uh, Martin Jiski came here uh, talking about diversity and re retention. But when you filtered through all that was presented, the bottom line was we're not getting them here to begin with. Uh, for example, we only had a handful of students out of Indianapolis public schools. And had that been going on for some time? Not too many came, or <sighs> or there's change over time. Sometimes you may get more than others. Well, <clears throat> there is an unusual movement of students from one school to another. Okay. Um, a certain number of dysfunctional families. And kids are sort of banded about and a lack of stability. And what we're doing, we're, we're, what we needed to do and what is now taking place. Uh, we went down into the middle schools and started programs with a lot of support to have those students get on track. You cannot be admitted to Purdue unless you have a background in science and math and sure. that sort of thing. And the kids are missing it. And suddenly, grandmothers <laughs> become interested in what kids were doing and mothers become interested. In, sure. And uh, there was a movement to track uh, middle school students through high school and to try and make sure that they're better grounded in the sciences than what they had been. And I think that is making and is going to make a Science Bound has really has been a good program. Yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Jeske was pretty yeah, much involved yeah. in it. It's yeah. really, really caught on. And yeah. you need to get that whiz so they really get that incentive going. Yeah. Well, and well, well, if you wait till they're a junior, senior in high school, it's too late. Too late. That's right. You have yeah. to get down earlier you so that they get the skills that are they need and they can move with it. You have to sow the seeds early and get the, cause them to understand how important it is that they they go to school and they pay attention and they have the tools to to, to make it. it here. That's right. Yeah, student trustee. You um, that's started in seventy five, if I'm not mistaken, didn't it on the board? Well, my two oldest sons were both student trustees prior to the program we now know. Which is a voting uh, yeah. thing. Okay. They, they were permitted to talk and... Uh, how did they get, how was the appointment, uh, how did it come about then? Because now That was a student election at that time. For, uh, Early on. Okay. The first ones were student uh, elections. 
And I, about the mid seventies, the legislature changed uh, to. I think it was seventy five, if not. Gubernatorial. Gubernatorial. I was there, and I remember having talked about the bill. Uh, uh, became a, a gubernatorial appointment again, but a group of uh, five named five names were submitted to the governor from the university. Mm -hmm. Again, student chosen here, uh, and uh, then he from those five he chose a uh, an appointee. Uh, We've had a tremendous, tremendously successful program. Those have been first That's class, been very first class human beings, right. and outstanding students. Anna Day was one in 2001. Well, Anna Day's grandpa and my are dear friends. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he wasn't bashful about wanting to make sure his granddaughter was appointed to the board. <laughs> she was she was exceptionally good. She Let me good. ask you this, since your two sons were in it, what role did they play? Uh, because I think this is something that the researchers could benefit by. They know student trustee, but there was something before that. Well, they, uh, they uh, could they sit in? I mean, oh uh, sure. Okay. You're permitted to speak, but not vote. Okay. And they weren't bashful about expressing their feelings. They're both Good students, bright kids, and my son Mark, is, I think, is the only one at this point who has been both a student trustee and, and a right. regular trustee. Uh -huh. And Mark just went off the board uh, uh, a few months ago, but uh, uh, there to express a student's point of view about issues before the university. And I, you know, I think that were the were your two sons. Would that have been the first time that there were appointments, or were, had there been appointments? I before? think there there might have been one or two ahead of them. Okay. Okay. So maybe in the 60s somewhere, somewhere along that well, line, might have the, had some. Well, um, Jay graduated in 76 and Mark in 77, and it was probably their senior year they served. And uh, there were, I think, two or three uh -huh. before them who were elected the same way they were by the student body. The student trustee, can they be reappointed or do they have to have somebody? It's a, a three-year term. It's a three-year term, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. So they could be reappointed if they wanted uh, to. None have been at no. this point. Uh, technically, if they if they were patent to be a freshman and then a graduate student, right. uh, if they're going to still be around, it as could a be. But uh, so up till now, no one has been. Uh, it's been a one, right. been a three-year term. Right. And they have been exceptionally good. Um, students and retention. You mentioned you addressed that a little bit before, but that's a, a consideration that the board has discussed: retention of the students. Well, it's, it's it's a constant challenge everywhere, yes. and sure. Uh, We'd like to have that as high a percentage as we as we could. Not everybody's going to graduate, uh, and that doesn't mean that one or two years here, even if you don't, did not graduate, does not benefit society. It indeed, does anyway. Any sort of experience like that benefits society. But um, there's always that you know that uh, sort of plaque you want to hang on the wall about we graduated. It's higher percentage, <laughs> higher percentage than our peers <laughs> at the university, you know. So. Uh, before I, we, we were mentioning earlier yeah. about Amelia, we want to make a comment, before I forget, make yeah. a comment about that. Uh, well, you know, I, was, I was kind of... Because that'll news. help our uh, <laughs> archives and special collections. We have the collection up there. <laughs> <laughs> well, she was an icon when I was a child. Did, you, did you meet her? Yes. Oh, how did that come about? Well, uh, I was in a meeting some time back, and they asked for a show of hands of people who met Amelia Earhart. <laughs> I did. I was nine years old. <laughs> Great. And, uh, Here, what, uh, yeah. was it a special event? Or? Well, no. Um, my oldest sister lived in the first women's residence hall. That right? would be Doomy, because that's where well, she was, which is now, there's the, a couple of buildings. It's the one, well, mm -hmm. when I was in college, it's called South Hall. It's the okay. one nearest State from, Street. Right. Uh, the Across from Meredith, isn't right? it? I don't know what the name yeah. is now, but it's the nearest do me. It may be. Involved but it was or? finished in the fall of 1934. Okay. Prior to that time, there had been no facilities of any kind for women. And when that hall was finished, she was in the first group to move into it. And um, uh, although uh, President Elliott, I think, has received most of the credit for it, somewhere between President Elliott and Dean Dorothy Stratton, Amelia Earhart, was brought to campus in the role of being an icon for the women students. In other words, you'd like for our women students to reach the stars, and here's a young lady who could be a role model for them. And most of that year, Amelia lived in the residence hall. 
and uh, mother and I happened to be there one evening when Amelia was having a reception in the uh, residence hall, and my oldest sister took me against my will, I suppose, to meet Amelia Earhart. <laughs> like, who is she? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I knew who she was. <laughs> she, uh, you know, as, sure. as, That's uh, with nice. many tragedies, uh, they become famous after the tragedy occurs. So when she was lost in the Pacific, well, I think I was 11 at that time, it became quite a conversation at our dinner table with searching for Amelia in, in right. a sense. And, but uh, she indeed was there in the flesh in, in that year and following that as well. And I did have my opportunity to say hi to her. Yeah, she really made an impact on she the did. university. And she did. We had an interview, we did an interview with Dorothy Stratton, you know, a couple mm -hmm. of weeks, some mm -hmm. years ago, and she yeah. shared, because their offices were close by. Mm -hmm. And uh, she would well, have to I'm not, <clears throat> uh, my sister Vida always maintained that Dorothy Stratton had as much as anyone to do with Amelia being on campus. And I didn't know what the division was between the effort between Dorothy Stratton and, and Edward Elliott, but uh, perhaps it was a joint one. Yeah, it could be. That's right. <laughs> yeah. How about the campaign for Purdue? You were, uh, that did pretty well, of course, everybody says, but you know, well, the board was helpful along that line, too, the and the people. Effort that Martin Jiski place towards raising resources for the university was exceptional. Uh, some previous presidents uh, felt that they, they had better things to do, but unfortunately, or fortunately, that's become very much a part of the duties of the university president. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, perhaps more of the time is consumed in that than what should be. However, Without resources, the university does not function. And I think Martin Jiski did an exceptional job of raising funds for the university and right. conveying to people how important that was. We had the resources we needed to, to be a first class institution. To move ahead. Yes. All right. And uh, I, uh, you know. We did it. Great job. That's right, exactly. Uh, you, we, you were on the search committee for Dr. Baring, for the Dr. Baring. We were no, I was not on for Baring. Oh, just on for the first. Uh, for just, yeah, was, okay, no. but that's but searches for the president. The board is very much involved in that. Well, as I believe, there were five of the uh, fourteen or fifteen members of the search committee who were trustees, and mm -hmm. um, uh, I was appointed to it. And when it came down to the interview time, I. I took one half of the search committee and Tim again on the other half, and we divided up and, and essentially had two interviews for each candidate down towards the end. And uh, it was. Uh, it's a long experience. process, isn't it? Yes. And people don't done, done properly. It. And uh, uh, I think that uh, with Tim's leadership, uh, I think we did an exceptional job of sorting through uh, potential presence of Purdue and making the right decision. Right. Good, good point. Um, participation in the alumni. You've been pretty active in the alumni at the time, haven't you? Well, perhaps more active with the Ag Alumni mm -hmm. than the regular Alumni Association. And the alumni groups, as with many other organizations, it's become a challenge today to, because there's so many things to do. I know. I think Purdue has to be one of the better ones in, in the country. Purdue Ag Alumni is exceptionally unique. We're sort of clannish sometimes, <laughs> but uh, it's been a fun experience. Yeah. And all the, the, the number of meetings and the numbers sometimes uh, get broadsided by other demands. Well, I understand. Uh, one could not go to an Ag Alumni meeting anywhere without having a good time. And, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> it's that camaraderie that we get trails well, along with you. It started out, and I don't know that other universities are like Purdue or not, but uh, this was post-war. And the veterans situation may have had something to do with it, but there was a tremendous uh, friendship between the professors and the students when I was in college, and that didn't end with graduation. I, uh, I made friends here uh, with some faculty people that lasted a lifetime until most of them are gone now, but uh, they followed me after mm -hmm. college and uh, maintained a close relationship with many of them. 
uh, until he passed away. Yeah, that's right. What about some traditions? You have a favorite tradition, Purdue tradition, since you've been uh, around here quite a while as a student <laughs> and uh, other well, responsibilities. Well, we get awfully busy during football season. <laughs> I know that one. I, I'm uh, in that tradition, too. <laughs> I saw the first game at uh, Ross State, I believe, in 1933, my first game. And that's, what, 74 years ago now? And uh, oh, we don't miss many. No, that's that's just, we try and get back to campus, and then and, you know, and other way games too. But and uh, the bowl games too. There are more yes. of them now, right? right? There was that big lump there for a mm -hmm. long time, but it's one of the classic Indiana Purdue games was in 1936. How's that? Well, it was a 2020 tie. We didn't play off ties then. And of all, if someone describes the history of the Indiana-Purdue rivalry, they won't miss that 1936 game. Uh, uh, Purdue came back in the last couple minutes and tied the game, and uh, had the uh, professional game been as pronounced as what it is now, many of those football players have gone professional after that. But. Uh, uh, Did they have to leave it as a tie? They couldn't. The, the, we didn't play off ties then. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was the game was over. That was the game tie. was over at the end of the game, and uh, the, uh, I was ten years old, and uh, I remember that game very well. Yet oh, Cecil Isbell yeah. yeah. was the quarterback at Purdue, and he played. He played professionally with the Green Bay Packers for sure. a number of years, and a uh, player by the name of Vern Huffman from Newcastle, who was both basketball and football at IU, was one of the IU players that day that uh, was quite a talented player too. Uh -huh. That uh, nice that you were at that game. It classic. Was it here at Purdue? Or yes. Was it, oh, that makes it even nicer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, the are you still when you were on the board? You were with the Purdue Research Foundation. Were you a director there? Was Where? that uh, Purdue Research Foundation? Yes. We were for part of that time. Part of that yeah. time, uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that's involved in yes. some things. Now, let's talk a little bit about some of your awards. How about Sagamar the Wabash? <laughs> and I think this is great, the Master Farmer by Indiana Prairie Farmer. That's wonderful. How, tell us, were you, how do they contact you to let you know about this? And your outstanding agricultural alumnus. That's wonderful. And you have others, I'm sure. Well, the Ag, the ag Alumni has what is called a Certificate of Distinction award that uh, probably four or five, matter of fact, I just today or yes, last night read a letter recommendation for a faculty member in retirement for that uh, that award, but they recognize uh, four or five graduates or people with Purdue, Purdue connections a year that have done things that are supposedly notable in the sure. either academic or business community and I've been fortunate enough to That's receive that nice. award. It's and nice to be recognized. Well, may have deserved it, may have not, but I, I accepted it. <laughs> <laughs> what about the Sagamore? Did, did you have well, one I or have, two? I have three. Huh. Yeah. Um, you know, there's an interesting thing about that that they don't keep a list of them. And be and it it's interesting because sometimes I've known others such as yourself who've gotten and they'd like to know well. The, but there's no list out there unless you. I, get, I, get I know of none. No, no. Because uh, some have more than one. Depends on the governor, you know. Well, it's you know. It's, it's nice. It's some wonderful. sort of service of some kind to the state, and some governor has been more generous with those and, than others, and maybe at the point of overdoing it. But. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice. Yeah, it's a special I, thing. I received my first one for legislative service uh, from Matt Welsh, who was governor back in uh, the early '60s. And uh, I've gotten two cents then, both for primarily university service, I suppose. Very good. Do they, did they contact you, or was it a surprise? The last one was. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, last one they gave it to me at the, at the uh, football game luncheon one day, so <laughs> I didn't know it was coming. <laughs> that sounds good. I like that. Um, one of the things that I think is very nice is that outstanding, the town's an outstanding communicator. Mm -hmm. um, an agriculture debate competition. That's something new, and tell us a little bit about that. Well, how that came It about. has a genesis. And uh, I'm not supposed to tell things like this, but it's an interesting story. A lot of the GIs struggled um, with some of the basic 
things that we have come to believe that are terribly important. And I had a fraternity brother who was ready to graduate, was not a good English student, and he struggled passing English composition, as did many of his peers. And I have witnessed uh, young students who had difficulty communicating, both spoken word and written word. And I thought, if I'm going to give something to this university, I'm going to start with the School of Agriculture, because that's where I came from. Whatever I might be able to do to improve the speaking skills of students to make sure they're able to communicate would be important. And I'm thinking about maybe doing that with a writing uh, exercise now. But regardless of the skills you have of a technical nature, unless you can communicate that to the people you're working with or want to uh, bring aboard with some project that you're working on, you're disadvantaged. And I would hope that we can impress upon Purdue graduates the, import the importance of communication skills, whether that's writing or speaking. We have five children who have developed an excellent ability to speak well on their feet and to write well. Our oldest makes his living as a wordsmith in New York City. Pretty tough market. He attributes that to a Purdue professor who told him one day he was lazy and he could not, did not know how to write. He got Jay's attention. But the professor said, Jay, if you want to learn, I'll teach you. And this wasn't an English professor. <laughs> this was a political science professor. And Jay's response was, Professor, you're on. We'll do it. <laughs> but uh, from that spark that that professor built under him, our oldest son, Jay now prepares and markets television, radio commercials, direct mail, makes his living doing that. A very okay. tough market. Tell us a little about your family. Did you meet your wife? Uh, did you meet your wife here? Mm -hmm. Okay. And of course, you said all your children have mm -hmm. gone here mm -hmm. too as well. Yeah, I looked up. At that time, there were five and a half men to one woman on the Purdue campus. Goodness and, gracious. Uh, I tell everybody that uh, I didn't have a date till I was a senior, but that, that's not quite quite right. Stretches <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> that's <okay. laughs> But it was competitive. <laughs> and, uh, 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 Purdue admits many more women now than what they used to. But, uh, right. This is, again, post-war, and uh, 60 to 70 percent of the male students are GIs. And, uh, uh, you know, and we have, we've had an evolution, really, because at one time, uh, women could do two things. They could be a nurse or be a teacher. Right. And thank goodness we've jumped that hurdle. Now they can do anything anybody else wants to do. And uh, Purdue's attracted some very exceptional women students who can do anything they want to do. That's right, exactly. And the world is there, and they move, and they take, go with it, right? Yeah. Now, you resigned from, and your son is, was on the board. He succeeded mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. but is he still on the board? No, he, oh. uh, this is a, 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 a gubernatorial appointment. It's up to the governor, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, he was appointed by uh, Governor Kerner. And uh, when the uh, new administration uh, took over after Kernan's term, why? They, he uh, was to fill out your term, was that when he, he was on? Okay. Well, uh, I was there 15 years. Mm -hmm. And I was getting close to 80, and I thought I should not ask for reappointment. So I told Governor Kernan at that time, uh, I love this, I love to do this, but sure. someone younger should replace me. I asked him to consider my son Mark, and he appointed him. I think that's probably one of two family uh, situations where there have been two in the same family appointed mm -hmm. to the board to produce history. Mm -hmm. So we we're kind of pleased to be able to, to Very do nice. that. And Mark had a great experience there. Mark was a relatively young trustee as trustees go, but uh, was pretty s pretty solid on his feet. It was very ni nice, nice gesture there. Mm -hmm. How about uh, an outstanding event in your life? You got one that you'd like to share with us? And how about a favorite or long memory of Purdue? Take your pick. Well, 
If you're talking about any single event, of course, there, there, there are many. If you're talking about what's terribly important, the material items pale into ins insignificance. When uh, Helen had, I met my wife here, and uh, she, we both had other friends for a long time. Finally, uh, they became sort of buddies, and then it grew from there. Uh, but that union has produced five exceptionally young people, exceptional young people. And I don't, all the material things we have are insignificant compared to right. five youngsters who have become a very good, said. very good friends. And I wake up every morning thinking I'm the, one of the most fortunate people on the face of the earth because of that. We had a surprise birthday party for Mother the 1st of May, and everybody was there. And uh, I have a picture of those five youngsters and Mother that it's, it's, it's pretty dear. It's pretty nice. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Besides that, you're all pretty people. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's and, the icing on and it. One, and one, I guess, is about to come back here. She's been admitted to a doctoral program in nursing that I uh, sometime soon. She's back on campus. So. Very good. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Um, any questions that uh, were not asked that you would like to share or any general comments? I think well, you've done very well. Shared with a, a lot. Number one, I believe in the land grant system. Uh, there was a time in this country when only the moneyed people got to do, got to go to college, the aristocracy. And um, uh, Justin Merle, uh, oh, let's go back beyond that. This is a part of Purdue's history. In the 1830s, uh, there was a movement on the part of agricultural people to express concern about lack of training for people in agriculture. And they asked the then United, the Indiana University, State University, to include... The one in Terre Haute? Huh? In Terre Haute? In, no, no. Uh, the State University of Indiana. Oh, Indiana sorry. University. I'm sorry, okay. <laughs> to include some agricultural courses. And, uh, but there's no appropriation. So the, the bottom line was no money, no instruction. Had they done that, they might never have been to Purdue. So Good part point. of Purdue's history. And uh, following that, Justin Merle, the senator from New York, whose father was a blacksmith, uh, moved in Congress to establish uh, training for agriculture and the mechanic arts. Uh, Buchanan vetoed it. Lincoln signed it two years later, and from that came the roots that Purdue was established to move on a part of uh, Morrow. Uh, the original thought was we'll have something like the Army Academy or the Naval Academy, and but it ended up being one in each state. But had the people at IU uh, decided to offer oh, agriculture, we might not have had Purdue, <laughs> as they do in some other states. Yeah, but. Uh, the mission here of making it possible for people of modest means to go to college, I think, is a very noble one. And I'm sure my fellow trustees uh, and the administration grew awfully weary of me talking about making possible for people of modest means who live on Main Street to go to college. Okay. But very key. Any, anyone who's gone through the depressions I have or gone through the GI Bill experience cannot come away from that and not understand what a tremendous benefit this has been for the common good. Uh, prior to the war, probably 13 to 15 percent of high school graduates went on to college of some kind. Today it's over 60, who take some sort of formal post-secondary education. And that has made a tremendous difference in our standard of living and uh, in the way of life, in the way of life, the good things we have in this country. All right. But you can, you know, this is Purdue. All right. This is why we're here. Uh, I, <clears throat> from time to time, thought someone should take 
the contribution that Purdue has made, and put it in book form, especially in the standard of living that we have. A tremendous success story. I was out to Iowa last week uh, for the program for Phil Nelson, who was given what amounts to a Nobel Peace Award or Peace Prize Award for the, from the food industry. And uh, it's a proud day for Purdue. You know, they just uh, what Phil, and then Phil came from fairly modest means, as did Martin Jiske, as did Michael Burke. Uh, and without students like that, you know, who knows? That's right. We're going to light a spark and, and encourage someone to do great things and make life so much better than what it now is. Very nice. Yeah. That's very nicely said, and that, that's very true. Yeah. And it means a lot. Yeah. And that's the learning. That's what we're here for. Thank you. Which is good. And, and I don't know, I don't know how you measure motivation. I don't think anybody does really. But uh, somewhere out there. <laughs> That's right, exactly. There's another Nobel Prize winner somewhere. Right. There's another <laughs> we Lester. We're going to be here for it. <laughs> another Lester Geddes somewhere. Right. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. I want to thank you, Mr. Thomas. Oh. I've really enjoyed this. It's been very good. Well, this concludes our interview. Thank you very much. Fun. <clears throat>